is it a case that maybe he doesn't know his best 11 because he's got new players in and new players to even feature for the first time for Chelsea. So we're just going to have to wait a little bit to find out, as is he. Well, I mean, look, it doesn't look like he does, but it may be for the reasons that you've mentioned. And we've talked about Chelsea and all kinds of chaos, and that chaos continues, right? I mean, it's not an easy one. I was thinking how to come down on this because, you know, it's it's, it's easy to, you know, in our job, it's easy to to just go at it and say, two hills got to go and these players are not good. But at the end of the day, I have to look at it from, from a standpoint, you know, have I been in a situation like this? And if I haven't, what would have happened if, if, if it was? And look, that chaos started, obviously, with Roman Abramovich. We all, we all know the story. Late into the transfer market, I mean, I don't want to say they were bankrupt, but for a while, they, you know, they couldn't do anything financially, right? Uh, so that the market started late for them, which, which is not always the case. And then you have, you have the new ownership that comes in and spends an incredible amount of money because they have to. And somewhere in between... Because of what happened in the conflict in Roman Abramovich, or in the war, I should say, not even conflict, uh, is that some players wanted to leave, others didn't know what was going to happen. So imagine prepare, finishing the season like that, thinking what may happen, who's going to be the owner, then finding out, okay, it's not so bad, but I'm gone, or I want to be gone anyway. So what do we know about Chelsea Thomas Tuchel? That he's still pragmatic. Defensive stability, okay, is the most important thing for Thomas Tuchel, right? He's going to sacrifice what's going, you know, what's going to happen going forward if he feels that the back three or four and that midfield is one where it's difficult or almost impossible to score against. I mean, look, you're losing Christensen, Rudiger. For most of the time right now, you have Thiago Silva, the oldest player that you have, having to play every game because Koulibaly comes in, scores a wonderful goal, but gets red carded. Fofana comes in straight to the lineup right after a long saga of it all. In the midfield, you have N'Golo Conte, who showed you how incredible he can be in that game against Spurs, right? So flashes of him, injured again, and we know he's not going to probably be able to go the whole season. You have Jorginho in and out. You have Kovacic that started injured. I mean... I think if you, I, I think he knows the starting eleven, but but he just doesn't have it. Okay, so let's talk about Pierre Emerick Aubameyang because that's surely got to change a lot for him. Absolutely, and I think this was a great move. It almost doesn't matter what he well, it matters what he does or he does not, but it stops the narrative that you and I and everybody else will bring, right? Because they didn't have a number nine and they didn't have one that was scoring consistently. So at the very least, now you're getting a player that has scored in the Bundesliga, that obviously uh, uh, you know scored at Arsenal, uh, uh, a player that went to Barcelona, looked the part. Uh, and, and score goals. So you have a player that at least gives you that little bit of peace, right? Where you can maybe put these those pieces that we're talking about together. And now, whenever you know, when you start to get uh, most people back, you have Ob Aubameyang that's going to have to do the job. And we'll see if he's up for it because Lukaku, we thought the same, but somehow he didn't do it. Uh, Timo Werner wasn't the man. I don't think Kai Havertz is the man, even though he's... Yeah, but the, these two have got the relationship already, Janish. And well, Bamiyang and Tuchel. Well, but he's going to find a way to play him. And yes, you know, Th you know, Thomas Tuchel will probably live or die by him. I mean, Thomas Tuchel's job is on the line. I, I, th well, I think he's got to be careful here because well, I'll save that thought because we've got a hot seat tometer. Actually, we're going to have one every week. We'll see how close he is to the hot I seat. But I, you do, you, you do think it, there's a concern. I mean, well, I, I do. I'll say it because I'll forget it. Um, just remember what I said. <laughs> I won't, but go on. Uh, um, well, I do, because you know with Abramovich, remember how 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 short the leash was, right? I mean, he wasn't afraid to change managers, and he was always proven right. Now, with Todd Bowley, and I don't know that for a fact, but, uh, but you know, we, we sometimes here in this country go, you know, in America, you know, always number one, and I cringe at that. It's true, by the way, but we don't know him. But I'll tell you what. Todd Bowley probably is that sort of a man because he didn't spend $400 million before the season, took ownership of that club to say, you know what, we're good making top four. Look, how much does a top four get you or Champions League? We know it's a lot of money, but when you spend $400 million, even winning it doesn't get you that money. It probably doesn't matter. I mean, it's a given that they have to be top four, right? So I have a feeling that, the, that Todd Bowley 
is going to be very much like Abramovich in many ways. I don't know how that's going to how he's going to execute that. And I'm not saying I'm not sitting here and he's saying that, you know, five losses or something like that is a new manager coming in. But I wouldn't be surprised. I, I think he took this over. I think people like that who are so hands on, mind you, because you have the Cronkies of the world, you have Glazers of the world, right? They're rich, they're maybe even richer, but they're not so hands on. I think he came here, he spent an incredible amount of money, and he's saying, look, I want results, right? Maybe somebody's going to sit him down and say, yeah, well, by now, the way we started already, we don't have everybody just yet. Yeah, coming first, I had to mention the city of Liverpool may not happen just yet. But I'll tell you what, if there is a worry about top four or this, you know, things aren't going well in the current edition of the Champions League, uh, do you think this, Todd, you know, Todd, Todd Bowie is going to say, yeah, I'll give him time. I don't think so. I think I think Tuchel knows. Well, time will tell. Now, we can't go past this game without talking about the VAR situation. And it's going to help us delve quickly into quite a few situations over the weekend where we'll get a yes-no answer from you. But West Ham, as of today, is seeking clarification over the decision that rules out Maxwell Connay's equaliser. Very, very upset about this decision. Many people upset about VAR. Where do you stand on it? This particular situation or VAR? Yes, this, but this particular situation, and then we'll get into VAR yeah. and, uh, across the weekend. I changed my mind on it. At first, I thought, because, you know, I always think, see, see, that's the problem with the laws in VAR and the minute detail and the slow motion that I went from normal gut feeling as a former player where I could just say yes or no to like finding a reason why this goal may not stand, right? And that's the problem we have. You know, I always want to say, you know, like give us our game back. I, I don't have the answer for it, for it, what needs to happen, but it just, I look, I don't want to be talking about it every show here, right? Because it's boring to me, but but in this particular city, I was looking for something and I said, well, maybe, maybe there's some sort of law that I don't know, right? I'm not a referee. They say pundits have to know laws of the games. I used to know the laws of the games because they were simple. Now, I have to have a book, and by the time I find the law, you know, you know yourself, it's it's over. So uh, I thought maybe because it was close to his head or something like that, but no. The the short answer to that is is uh, there was nothing there. Uh, the goal should have uh, stood. Uh, look, I'll tell you that that I think Mendy felt guilty because he knew he made a mistake, not the first one in the game. Um, uh, when he was kind of punching or pushing that ball away, he knew he was in trouble. Uh, I think that Jared Bowen was probably thinking that if he goes down, it may be a penalty, but he didn't go down, right? I mean, you know, did he do absolutely everything to avoid contact? No, but and, and at the end of the day, this, this needs to stand as a goal. Okay, yeah, Moyes called it a ridiculously bad decision, and obviously we're going to hear more about it, but let me bring up a few of the decisions over the weekend then, and you can give me a yes or no, because there's been a bit of an upset this weekend about VAR, whether there's a crisis there. Okay, Virgil van Dijk's tackle has been one of them. Where do you stand on this one? Yeah, I, I, I think he knows there could have been a red, right? Um, it's It's... Nowhere near the ball, kind of stood there on him as well. I mean, it was a tackle. I mean, his shin studs very late to it and, and kind of, you know, I don't know if he stood on his foot because he kind of wanted to make sure that he doesn't go completely through it or whatever the reason. But if that was shown a red, uh, I there'd be no complaints, I promise you. All right. So that's the first one of them. Newcastle's goal getting overturned. And that was, uh, I have to look, Tarek Mitchell. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it was an own goal, right? And yes, an own goal. Joe Willock really being pushed into Gua uh, into Guaita. Guaita. Yeah. Guaita. That should have st stood because I think Tarek Mitchell, I mean, at the very least, it should have been a penalty anyway, right? But, it, you know, it went in, so you can't reverse that. Yeah, I don't see any problem right there because I, I think, you know, you know, there was a push in the back of it. Uh, and then in the end, goes off his chest. I didn't see a problem with that. that that's a goal for me. Uh, Leeds no penalty, which obviously had Jesse Marsh extremely frustrated. Oh, um, I think it's a penalty. I think it's a penalty because you know, you know. Remember some of the laws of the games, and and that was um, uh, Aaron Hickey on Somerville, wasn't it? Somerville, yeah. First of all, Somerville embarrassed him, beat him. You know, all ends up. He knew he was late. 
remember the hold on the jersey was outside but remember there's a law that if you continue that into the penalty area just because it's outside doesn't matter now i don't know if that stopped that on the line if it did that's part of the penalty area but the contact afterwards and the pull on the shoulder that to me is a penalty i mean he was beaten all ends up he was doing everything possible to bring him down but do what needs to be done is look for the ball and actually win it right so I can understand why he was frustrated. I'm assuming that's what he was talking about. I don't know what language Jesse was using. Now, I can still go to Jesse Marsh and say, look, man, you're new to this league. I know the frustration. I know you have to uh, protect your team. So, but, you know, your team is better when you're on the pitch, not off the pitch. But in terms of that, that to me was a penalty. All right. Uh, Coutinho, goal disallowed. Yeah, I mean... I think we've all seen it. I mean, that's crazy. You know, in the old days, no VAR, that would have been a nice goal, right? <laughs> uh, yes, it, you know, it was an immediate decision. Uh, and obviously, you know, one that, once that decision was made, it was too late. The referees or the assistants are being told to to wait. Sometimes they're frustrating because everybody knows that it's a clear offside. And we're saying, why don't you raise the flag? So, you know, you can't have it both ways because I think that's the, that's the situation. We all get so frustrated that they don't do it, Kay. But I mean, obviously, that's a goal. Yeah, uh, all right. Brighton's Alexis McAllister with a goal of the season contender that will never be. Uh, what, what happened before that? Yes, there was a free kick. And who was, I think it was Mwepu, right? Mwepu made a play on, on that ball. I know we don't like it when the free kick comes from a wide area. Um, Mwepu, I think he was making that bicycle kick attempt, overhead attempt, wasn't he? I mean, he played the ball. He played on the ball while being in an offside position. So uh, um, I had no problems with it. Can't say that I caught it immediately in the game. I was like, well, why? We want to see beautiful goals like that. Uh, but but I think I think there was a, it was a right decision. When you go to VAR and kind of they tell you, well, look at this situation, which maybe they, you know, with the referee, they, they had to point toward that. Um, yeah, right decision. Is VAR a problem, yes or no? Uh, yeah, people operating, uh, it, operating it, yes. I mean, you know, we all say VAR, and then you get everybody saying, it's not VAR, it's the people. Well, of course. That, I wanted to say that because I'm going to continue to say that VAR is the problem. And I hope everybody understands that we're talking about people operating it uh, uh, um, and not anything else. So, uh, look, there's no going back. But I, you know, like everybody else, I want to enjoy the game. I, I just kind of, after this weekend, again, I want to just give me my game back. Thank you very much for watching ESPN FC on YouTube. For more highlights, analysis and exclusive content, be sure to subscribe.